welcome to the Work Trends Podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan Ambiro. Every week I interview interesting people who are reimagining work. And be sure to check out our Work Trends Twitter chat events calendar located at talentculture.com on the podcast page. Welcome everyone to the Talent Culture Work Trends Podcast. Today we are looking at a very important topic that many HR professionals are now grappling with, and that is... Drum roll, please. Employee engagement and performance. Yes, this is a popular topic. It's a classic topic. It's one I've been talking about for a gazillion years, it seems, because it's always been a challenge to keep employees engaged and performing at their best. But in recent years, it's become even more difficult with the rise of social media, the 24-7 connectedness of it all. We now have employees who are distracted, disengaged, engaged and burned out. There are many different approaches to designing these programs, but all too often they fail to achieve their desired results. In this episode, we are going to explore some of the most common reasons why these programs fail and what we can do to fix them. I am very pleased to have with us today our distinguished guest, Kevin Campbell of Lifted Leadership. Kevin has spent the last decade of his career building leaders at every level and creating scores of engaged, high-performing, strengths-based teams. He has driven talent strategy, employee engagement, performance management, and leadership development initiatives for clients in the professional services, medical device, banking, hospitality, yes, there's more, consumer products, tech, healthcare, and life sciences industries. He also served as a principal investigator and researcher for social science programs funded by the U.S. federal government. Prior to founding Lifted Leadership, Kevin served as a lead people scientist for Culture Amp, where he helped organizations like Airbnb, Palo Alto Networks, and ServiceNow in optimize their performance management and employee engagement initiatives. Kevin also served as workplace consultant and executive strengths coach for Deloitte Human Capital and the Gallup organization, helping coach leaders across the world's biggest companies. Hey, Kevin, happy to have you here. Happy to be here. Wow, that was a mouthful. Wow, indeed. Where are you today? I'm in sunny Southern California, North County, San Diego. Oh, we feel so bad for you. I mean, the weather's just terrible there, isn't it? I mean, it's <laughs> like, you know, how just every day is a sunny day. What's a sunny day? I'm jealous. OK, but we're happy to have you here regardless. You you keep it sunny. All right. I'll bring the sunshine with me. Sounds good. Well, listen, you know, the reason you started down this path is very personal for you. Would you mind sharing this part of your story with us? Wow. Getting right into the the, the deep of it, huh? <laughs> it, it, it is very personal personal for me. You know, I was just 10 years old when I got the call that something had happened to my mom. I wasn't exactly sure what was going on or what went wrong, but I was able to piece things together after hearing her and the other adults talk about what had happened. You know, she was a single mother working 12 to 16 hours a day to support my three-year-old sister and myself. And she was really good at what she did. But at one point it just got to be too much and she had a nervous breakdown. And on her last day at that job, she crawled out on her hands and knees, dripping in tears and sweat from emotional, psychological, and physical exhaustion. And uh, a short time later, she fell into a, a deep depression, which led to a series of events that led to us losing our home. And from that day forward, I, I really vowed to make the world of work better for people like my mother, because I, I know that better workplaces not only mean stronger businesses, but it also means stronger families families, healthier children, and stronger neighborhoods. Yeah, well, listen, thanks for sharing that, Kevin. It really means a lot to myself and the audience here. You know, work is personal. You know, let's stop trying to pretend it's not. Okay. I've been talking about the way in which people bring their whole selves to work for many, many years now. Luckily, we have this moment again, Kevin, where we can bring it to the forefront. So thank you for sharing. You know, talk to us about what is an employee experience scientist exactly and how the heck do you become one? I mean, that's pretty exciting. Well, most folks in my role have a background in organizational psychology, as do I. And if you think about the role of a people scientist, 
scientist or an employee experience scientist. I like to think about it in terms of a Venn diagram with three intersecting circles. So one is people analytics, but I think there's a big difference between being an EX scientist or a people scientist and people analytics, where as somebody from a, a people analytics perspective might come from more of a data science or a stats or a computer science background, we have some of that, but we're also really deep into organizational psychology. And then we're very practice oriented. So if you were to think of three intersecting circles, one's people analytics, one is organizational psychology, and the other one is applied practice. An EX scientist or a people scientist really sits in the intersection of those three things. And you want to have a good background, training, and experience working in all three of those in order to be really effective and, and move into an EX scientist role. So some sort of formal training or education in stats and organizational psychology, as well as the ability to translate that into practical real world applications for people working with people. And we're going to continue to work with people. I don't care what kind of technology we have, right, Kevin? I think that's absolutely true because there's almost always people building the technology and the people buying the technology and interacting with your organization are also people. So there's always going to be an element. It might not necessarily be person to person, but there is going to be an importance of building for humans and making sure that your product developers are building things that people actually want and the experience of what it's like to work as a product developer, a product manager, an engineer within an organization. Two words, employee engagement. What do these words mean to you? I mean, I think we know in general what this is, but what are some of the main components from your perspective? I think it's important to talk about what it's not just as much as it's important to talk about what it is. It's not a survey. And I think a lot of times people think employee engagement is the employee engagement survey. And we lose sight of the fact that it's actually an emotional and psychological state. It starts with emotional commitment. And I emphasize the emotional part of the emotional component because, you know, it's that, that desire to stay with an organization to fulfill its objectives, not just because you feel stuck or obligated, but because you feel connected and connected in a way that drives someone to go above and beyond and give their best effort at work. You know, someone who's not even part of the custodial or maintenance staff might actually do things like pick up trash or keep the, the workplace clean on top of their regular duties, not because they're forced to, but because they want to. And then lastly, it's that, that psychological connection, the degree to which someone's willing to recommend their friends and family and others to work at the organization, whether they're writing glowing reviews about the organization on Glassdoor and Indeed. And sometimes we lose sight of this emotional psychological component and we conflate it with things like the employee engagement surveys whether those be quarterly or, or yearly we tend to think about the measurement tool as being the thing that we're measuring but that's not the case there it's actually a psychological state that we're after the tool is just an instrument to be able to measure that what is a strengths-based development approach yeah, I mean, it really flips personal development and leadership development on its head in a number of different ways. You know, the traditional approach to developing people begins with doing some sort of an assessment between where you'd like them to be and where they currently are, finding those gaps in development, and then bringing them back up to baseline in order to close those gaps. And I think that's absolutely essential and important, but it makes a couple of different assumptions about human nature and success that I don't think the data really suggests is accurate. So, you know, it assumes that the best people in a role all look, act and behave in exactly the same way. When in my personal experience, I've known people who have been successful leaders that some of them have been extroverted, some of them have been introverted, some of them have been very instinctual, others are very data-driven. So there's a, a lot of variance in terms of what it looks like to be successful. And it also assumes that weakness fixing is what leads to success. And I don't think that's accurate. I think weakness fixing is absolutely important for barring against catastrophic failure, right? Weakness fixing is important in order to make sure that you don't fail, but it's not necessarily going to help you succeed. So strengths-based development is really about what are your naturally reoccurring patterns that potential for strength 
that's already within you, your natural ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving? And how can you take those things that are a little bit more automatic and instinctual and guide them in a way to where they can actually become strengths? How can you make them something that you, you can use to consistently produce near perfect performance with excellence. So we're not talking about going from bad to good. Strengths-based development is going from good to great, to great to excellence, and really being able to maximize and optimize uh, the nascent talents that already exist in each one of us. And it's not something that's done in lieu of being able to close gaps or weaknesses. It's an added lens that sits on top of that traditional development process. What are some of the ways that organizations approach engagement and this whole idea of standardization, standard results, for example? What's that about? Yeah, I, you know, I think there's a lot of ways that uh, the standard approach can fall short of what people are, are really looking to accomplish, but they, they all make sense. They, they all make sense on the, on the surface, right? So a lot of organizations will initiate an employee engagement program that's usually led by HR. Uh, it has the survey at the center of it and the purpose is to measure employee engagement and then usually starts with leaders taking action on company-wide initiatives and process changes and the point of it is really to gather feedback from employees for the purposes of understanding how employees feel but unfortunately when all of the action taking and the whole impetus begins with HR it begins to be seen as an HR thing where HR might be the facilitator, the coach, and the orchestrator, this is a business thing. And when the survey becomes the focal point of the program, rather than a tool to measure employee engagement, people start to stray away from actually taking action. And organization-wide actions are absolutely important, but they can take six to 12 months to really pick up steam. And six to 12 months to take action on a seemingly simple survey doesn't resonate with people. And that leads to a lack of credibility and ultimately lowers engagement. The very thing that it was built to bolster. Well, and on that note, what are right now the biggest challenges facing employee engagement and performance programs this year? What's happening there? And, and most importantly, how can we improve this? What are some of the tactics? Well, I think that the, the biggest problem, if you were to boil it down, is that most people overemphasize, most organizations overemphasize understanding and underemphasize improvement in action. So, you know, close to 90% of companies measure engagement or, or have an employee feedback program of some type, but only 7% of employees say that their company acts on feedback in a very effective way. Um, this is according to 2021 data. I, I don't know where it is in 2022. Uh, we haven't done that research yet, but I, I'm guessing it probably hasn't improved that much. So the key is really to use simple coaching skills in order to be able to not just have the engagement survey or the data be the, the end, but how do you actually translate that into simple actions that can have outsized impact on the culture of your company? Well, okay, I'm bringing up the magic word and um, it's technology. You know, talk to us about your point of view on how technology is going to play a role in employee engagement and performance programs going forward. Like, what does this all mean? What's next? Technology is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So the technology is table stakes. And I'm saying this as a person who, who works as an employee experience scientist for, for a tech firm, right? But it's, it's an enabler. It's the thing that you have to have in place in order to make all the other pieces happen. So can you field and close and act on a survey and track those actions within a couple of weeks? If you can't do that, then you don't even have a ticket to the game. So that's that's the beginning component of, you know, are, do you have uh, the ability to listen and have channels of feedback that exist outside of the regular cadence of a pulse survey or an annual engagement survey, right? Like you and I are, are having a, a conversation, but I might be able to ask you a question or propose a topic and vice versa. But when we think about the, the conversation that employees have with their HR teams or with the organizational leadership, a lot of times it's only driven by the leadership. But what channels do you have for that always on listening, for that passive data collection? Different ways of being able to get a feel for how engaged employees, employees are on a day in and day out basis, rather than just through these, these formal mechanisms that happen on a, on a regular cadence. 
Love it. I have to say, you know, I've learned so much from just spending a little bit of time with you today. I feel like we could do another one of these and have much more to talk about. But I have to say, thank you so much for stopping by and and sharing your sage with us. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Work Trends Podcast, your favorite source for all that's new and exciting in the world of work. If you love what we do here, make sure to share our podcast with everyone you know. And don't forget, tune into our next episode. Catch up with you next time. Thanks for listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. Join us every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for a live Twitter chat with our podcast guest. To learn more about guests featured on today's show, visit the show notes for this episode at talentculture.com and help us spread the word. Subscribe to Work Trends wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating, review, and iTunes. Share Work Trends with your coworkers, your friends. Look forward to it. See you next time.